So I'd like to welcome Simon Pang from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Felipe Perez, City of Firebell, Steve Maxey, Merced County, and Ann Rogan Edge Collaborative. Please come to the stage. So Simon is a direct air capture expert. And I'll just relay a short anecdote while they're taking their seats. Um, so I, I, I had the pleasure of visiting Lawrence Livermore National Lab a few, maybe about a year ago. And if you've seen the movie Wonka or like Red Charlie and the Chalka Factory, it's kind of like that, but for carbon capture, this particular, uh, where, where Simon works, all kinds of different ways of capturing CO2. And it's really exciting and cool. Um, so Simon, first question to you, can you describe direct air capture and how California is positioned to be a focus for that technology? We've seen that on a bunch of maps, how that's, you know, the color shade is, is DAC, it can happen here. Why here and, you know, explain that. All right, sounds good. Um, let's see, make sure this works. All right, great. Um, yeah, so direct air capture. So we've heard a lot today about things that can be implemented today. You know, things in agriculture that we can do now. Direct air capture is a little further out. It's under development. So direct air capture is a set of technologies that uh, will directly just filter CO2 out of the atmosphere using chemistry and physics. I come from the world of chemistry and engineering, not from the world of biology. Um, and so, you know, I think that these kinds of technologies can play a role alongside the biological solutions to, to help address um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Three things that direct air capture technologies need. They need the air, so you need to be able to operate on the atmosphere to be able to get the carbon dioxide out of it. They need energy, so we don't uh, use these kinds of processes in a one-way kind of fashion. Whatever materials go into it, we regenerate them to be able to capture more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the last thing you need is, is something to do with the carbon dioxide. So you need geologic storage, like we've talked about in, in other panels. Um, a couple of examples. So you know, these technologies are being developed currently. Um, the couple of images I have at the top are from you know, around the country, around the world. Uh, these are facilities that are currently removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at about the 1,000 tons per year scale. Uh, the mock-ups down at the bottom are uh, you know, renderings of what people envision uh, a facility that would operate at the million ton per year scale would look like. So something on the order of you know, five to 10 acres maybe um, for the facility itself. Uh, you know, the energy required to operate these things obviously would potentially require a lot more land, but you know, as was mentioned earlier today, uh, that kind of um, you know, wind development could be co-located with something like agriculture. Uh, the reason why, all right, so, you know, James, you asked about why California, why do direct air capture in California? Well, you know, California has a history of being kind of early movers on a lot of projects. Um, what I'm showing here is the map from the Department of Energy uh, that uh, was released in, in conjunction with all of the direct air capture hub projects. Um, so we've got three different flavors of hubs, depending on whether or not these are, you know, kind of feasibility studies, design studies, or actually trying to build something. And, you know, California won four of these. We've got four that are, uh, that people are thinking about, you know, how do we actually operationalize this kind of technology? How do we start doing? Can I ask you about, just to define, we, we've heard about these hubs. We've heard about hydrogen hubs, arches. We've, we've heard about direct air capture hubs. What exactly is a hub? Like, Great what, what are we talking about with the DAC hub? What is that? Yeah, so when we think about direct air capture, you know, like I mentioned, we need a lot of a lot of things. We need the energy, we need the actual direct air capture facility, we need storage. And so the hub concept is really, how do we bring these things together? How do we bring different technology providers together? You know, different technology providers may have different types of, of solutions for accomplishing the same end goal. And so, um, you know, they may operate better or worse in some locations. And so this is an opportunity to really test out different technologies in a particular environment. Um, Great, thanks. So Steve, I'd love to turn to you and ask how the topic of CDR has, if it's emerged at all in you know, regional planning conversations and thinking about the direction of development in the region. Um, and if not, if, this, if what we've discussed today has perhaps you know, eliminated any paths by which it might. Uh, I'm very illuminated today. Um, 
So, yeah, it's uh, interesting timing just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there was a meeting of the California Planning Directors uh, Association. So 58 of us, really about 40 of us got in a room. And at some point, the, the idea or the question of whether uh, CDR projects have come up uh, directly to any of us uh, in any serious way, um, and probably 15 of us raised our hand, shock surprise, about eight of them were from the eight counties in the San Joaquin uh, Valley. And so we, we know that's something on the horizon. That's, those are opportunities that we're looking for, something that we're willing to entertain, uh, to foster, uh, streamline where we can, um, just to plug for, uh, to one of uh, Senator, Senator Caballero's comments, we are very streamlined in Merced County. Uh, we're happy to do business for any of you out there. I'm happy to hand out as many cards as I can at the end of the day. So uh, we're definitely open for business, but um, you know, we're looking for other opportunities, certainly. Uh, land repurposing, looking at natural and working lands uh, opportunities, uh, biomass in terms of dairy digesters, um, it kind of some of the low hanging fruit in the agrivoltaics or planting under, under um, solar farms. But there are constraints, right? Our number one constraint, you heard it a number of times, Julie Vance from CDFW brought it up earlier, water is our single biggest thing. You go up and down this valley, that is our single biggest issue in looking even at any of these projects. Um, there was a comment in the opening video of every region has its story. I think uh, Dr. Petridge made that comment. That is our story here. If you if you look at this, it just our county, where you sit today, we bring in 8%, Merced County brings in 8% of the total cash receipts for all of ag in California. There are eight counties in the San Joaquin Valley. Some of you are very college educated and can do your own math on what that, bring, what that means for the state in terms of revenue, in terms of jobs. From a water standpoint and Sigma and what we have to do to address Sigma, um, there are about a, about a million acres that will have to um, either be fallowed or uh, go into non-farming activities. And that brings with it about 50,000 jobs just in the San Joaquin Valley region. So that's a big piece to our story and probably a good thing. What percentage is a million acres of the total farmed acreage? In, in the valley, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I mean, it's a lot, right? Um, but you know, to, to one of the earlier points too, I think Karen Warner brought up, those are vulnerable jobs for us. And, and to the point that uh, Senator Caballero just made on the last panel, those are people we don't want to leave. Those are people that have been here for generations and, and are really critical to our workforce. Um, and so those are, those are things that we definitely want to focus on in the long term is how do we start to pivot that workforce if these are jobs that might go away. What hearing the hearing people who have projects and, and hearing these panels today, I'm curious to know, like as as someone who thinks about who, who's in this planning role, what are your questions about these projects and about the deployment of these technologies? You know, what what information are you looking to get more of to kind of make good decisions in your view about the future of this region? Yeah, so that was that was another um, comment that was made in the last panel too, right? Is there's there's not a lot that we know at the board of supervisors level or even at the staff level that might be more plugged into this, but not as plugged into it as some of our um, our electeds. And I'm sure that's something that, that Councilman Perez can speak to as well, um, and just what that interaction looks like at the at the local level. So I, I don't know if you want to add any comments. Okay. Um, yeah, from a from an economic development standpoint, you know, we, we want to understand what other opportunities there are out there to, to tap into some funding sources. Um, it came up a couple of times, but SURF funding or this California Jobs First, what, what we can do from an economic development standpoint. Um, how we can look at projects like this in association with other uh, decision-making tools that we know that are out there. Um, Department of Conservation spent a lot of time uh, a few years ago here in Merced County developing a tool called TerraCount that uses, um, it's a geospatial tool that looks at good uh, candidate lands or different scenarios for uh, land management strategies or, or different soil management strategies, for example. Um, so how do we use something like this in coordination with the findings from the Rhodes report to then help us inform our policies or incentivize certain things for companies that wanna come in and, and do business? Yeah, Councilman? Bueno, buenas tardes. Good afternoon to all, all of you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me over here. As uh, our uh, partner says, Steve said, I was thinking about how we can educate our community, first of all, uh, our Spanish-speaking or different languages. This is a big 
enormous, you know, gigantic information. Uh, I started since yesterday at 3 p.m. Uh, believe me, I dream about it. When I came here, oh my God, this is, how are you gonna digest this? How am I gonna take this information to my community, to all the community, because I walk all the communities from Farbo to, you know, to Kalinga to give the information. When I give this kind of information or another kind of information, people, you know, uh, uh, they said that uh, are not, I'm not uh, 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 asking for anything. I said, I came over here to make a social service for you guys. This is something that we need to give to everybody in the valley. They, didn't, they need to understand what is the good and the bad things about this. It's not just, oh, we have this, this is great. Uh, we, our communities, uh, as you know, as, as uh, disadvantaged communities that uh, we don't have the same funding, like uh, Merced or Fresno, we depend on the grants federally or state, and we don't have enough. And sometimes when I go to the meetings, it's the same thing that I ask to everybody. You guys said that I, they, you guys went to do outreach on my community. I didn't see you. I didn't see you. Where you guys went? Uh, they, uh, they said, oh, I, I went to the city and get 20 people. Why you don't go to the farmer's market? Why you don't go to churches? Why you don't go where people is, not where you want to go? Go and tell them, go ask for the, these voices that they can need to understand what you are guys are asking for, not what you want, because it's different. It's, uh, when we have you know, the big corporations and they are not living in the valley, and I told you, know, when they are spraying cotton and fireball around cotton, I start bleeding, my nose is bleeding. And uh, I told one of the representatives uh, from the state and said, oh, this is not uh, like a fact. I said, you need to come by when they are spraying cotton and stay next to me for a week. And you're gonna notice what I'm talking about it. <laughs> uh, people that have those corporations need to be here with us. Listen to us. What do we want for them? Community benefits. I, really, they're gonna give you the community benefits? to our communities, to small communities, where we need more education, where we need more health, it's a lot of healthy issues, where we need, you know, uh, better food, because uh, the people that work in the field, I, I used to be a, a farm worker, and I remember that I need to uh, go to the store and uh, choose between tortillas or, or something else to feed my family. Now it's worse, the utility bills, Right here, what a farm worker is right here. Thank you. Um, and I'd love to love to turn to you. Can you tell us what is Edge? What is the Edge Collaborative, and and what what is the organization's role? Um, yeah. So Edge Collaborative is a civic incubator. Um, I realize that's probably a foreign concept for most people. It's a foreign concept three years ago when we started it. Um, what we do is we partner with public, private, and nonprofit organizations and help them build new capabilities uh, to tackle economic challenges in their communities. Uh, we focus on workforce, on climate, and on community wealth. Um, happy to go into more detail, but um, I assume you have other follow-up questions. Yeah, so would love to understand, you, I know that you've been involved in a number of these community LEAP grant uh, uh, projects, and again, these are technical assistance grants that were awarded by Department of Energy to accomplish a particular goal related to the transition. And I think your region has been Stockton where you've, you've been working, been active on these, on these opportunities. Can you tell us about those projects and, you know, the, the, and, and the work on, on those? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the project orientation is an interesting one. Um, our team got involved in carbon uh, 2021. Uh, we got involved in carbon removal not because we wanted to and not because we wanted uh, this, we saw this as an opportunity. We, we actually came into the space because uh, of well-intentioned community outreach from industry players. And the nature of that outreach in 2020 and 2021 was really predicated on 
um, how do we engage with local communities where projects are contemplated to be cited? So industry was coming to your organization asking you for help to engage with communities. Is they were or, asking? They were. I will. I will reserve my cynicism. They were not asking to engage with communities. They were asking, I think, from a checkbox activity. Hey, we need to do some degree of community engagement. Who should we talk to? We want to explain our technology. And they were asking you that question? Yeah, oh, and okay. others. Okay, got it. The, the reason I give that as background context um, is not to paint industry as a bad player or award an ill-intentioned player, but to signal the fact that to uh, Mr. Perez's point, you have communities that have their, their core sort of bread and butter environmental issues, clean air, clean water, uh, potable sort of sources of, of um, nourishment have been neglected for decades. And you have these, these industry players that are coming in and sort of saying like, hey, let me tell you about this cool new mousetrap that I've built, right? That was actually the impetus for us to engage with, and I'll cite Julio Friedman's earlier comment, to engage with our national lab, who was our neighbor down the street in Livermore. That took us on a whole journey to say to, the, to Livermore, hey, there's a bunch of EJ groups here that have no idea what carbon removal is as a concept. We really think there's an important base setting of context that needs to be had so community can actually show up and actually articulate and have a point of, develop a point of view around what these technologies actually mean. That was the really foundation for us to even apply to the US Department of Energy's C-LEAP initiative to say, hey, we think there's a set of EJ groups here that uh, have a point of view. There's a lot of questions that they have. We really need uh, a coalition of scientists, engineers, and yes, social scientists. I will refer to the gentleman's comment in the audience from earlier to basically say, how do we make sense of what is happening? So how did you go about and do that? Because it sounds like what you were what you were doing then under that was a was in some ways an answer to what Mr. Perez was raising as, as a big issue. So what did you do and, and what was successful and maybe what was not? Can you give us any insights from the work you did? I'll, I'll cite a few things. One, I think this notion of disclosures is actually really important. Um, EJ communities, and I will not pretend to speak for EJ communities writ large, but when your basic environmental needs have been neglected for 30, 40, 50 years, you rightfully have some serious skepticism about whatever new technology is being contemplated in your region. That's point number one. The first thing that we did when we engaged with the Livermore Lab, and Roger, you can raise your hand if you would like. Um, Roger was an incredible advocate and collaborator of ours. Um, he and I co-facilitated a two-hour conversation with his team and some of the community in Stockton. And the first thing that he and his team did was set disclosures. Here's who we have collaborated with. Here's who funds the work. Here are the things that we are considering in the carbon removal conversation. That immediately set a different tone for mm -hmm. how community showed up to that. And that, I think, paved the way to actually go out and partner and say, we want to bring in more expertise, not less expertise, to actually support and make the case to, and I think a lot of EJ groups, uh, I will note Davis and Matt in the room if they'd like to raise their hands um, in their respective EJ groups, um, actually said, you're, this, you're making a geological argument, right? Or you're making sort of like an engineering technology argument. You have to understand the communities in which you're working. And if you do not, then communities will never show up and never show up to actually understand what's going on. And so I think it, it really comes down to disclosures and it comes down to actually how do you build trust in a way that is actually meaningful. And what do you think the most, I'm sorry to, Picking up, pick on you, but this is very, very interesting line. I think so. So beyond, so disclosures. That's really interesting, and um, understanding the community. What do you think, like of, of the various conversations you've been a part of, like how do you do this really, really well? Like, what can you can you share any additional examples of a of a conversation that you saw, for for example, that really succeeded at you know at at creating understanding, you know, creating engagement. Um, you know, what was done in that, in that conversation? So I'll throw out an analogy here, and um, I think it's important because there's a, it's a mixed audience here. Um, if you think about the moment we're in as a carbon gold rush, right, or a carbon rush, right, uh, the idea of a carbon rush and everyone's sort of trying to respond to public incentives, state, federal, county, whatever, what have you. Um, 
we have to look at the gold rush almost as an analog moment in time. And a lot of folks got really wealthy off the gold rush, but a lot of communities got screwed over in the process. And if we are not careful, we are going to replicate the mistakes of the gold rush in a carbon context. And that keeps a lot of us up at night. And so when I think about how we actually flip this to a productive frame, we're talking a lot about how we support our environmental justice partners around questions around monitoring, around safety, around an open set of research questions. I will say what came out of that Department of Energy collaboration is EJ groups put probably 250 hours of unpaid time um, into a set of research questions that we believed had not been answered, asked or answered. And we put that in front of the, de the Department of Energy team and they said, uh, you're correct. A lot of these questions have not been asked or answered. That's a little terrifying, right? That's a little terrifying. And so I think you can't afford to replicate EJ doing the work that is uncompensated and unpaid when we are trying to move at lightning speed to deploy a new, an entirely new set of technologies at speed. That's the first point. The second point is that as we get deeper into this process, a lot of our EJ partners are thinking about, as I mentioned, the monitoring, the safety, the research questions. Our team is focused now on the economic benefit question. When we say economic benefit, we're not talking about jobs. Jobs, don't get me wrong, are great, and living wage jobs are even better. But we are, jobs are ultimately an output of industry. They are not and should not be considered community benefits. When we talk about community benefits, we are talking about Jerry Maguire, show me the money, what investments are actually being made into communities where these projects are being contemplated to be cited. And there's a whole different conversation we can have about what that actually means in practice. But for us, I think as long as we are addressing core historical EJ issues and we are addressing the open research questions, then we can afford to have a conversation about the economic benefit piece. Right. Thank you. Um, so any questions so far from the audience? I know it's the end of the day, but come on, guys. This is very interesting stuff. Got to be some question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. <laughs> Here's the mic. Oh, my God. OK. Um, yeah, I guess a little bit about safety, right? So we have a, a lot of safety issues with like petroleum pipelines, fossil fuel. What are the safety things that are different now with CO2 pipelines? I mean, there was an explosion in 2020 where 40 people were hospitalized. And CO2, you can't smell it. You can't see it. So what are the safety mechanisms? What are some of the issues that come with trying to do carbon sequestration and pi piping it into geological areas? Like, what are some of the issues? Like, that's it, the differences between BECs and bikers. I guess that's for me, huh? Um, <laughs> you know, on the, the pipelines are tricky. Pipelines are, frankly, you know, the, a lot of issues associated with pipelines. Um, you know, I think in Roads to Removal, one way we tried to um, frame our thinking was, you know, can we avoid having to do pipelines, right? And so that framed part of how we, we thought about the analysis. Um, I would defer to the, the geologists and the geochemists on the, the storage question. Um, you know, my expertise is really above ground. Julio, are you still here? <laughs> oh, he left. Does anyone else want to take the underground storage piece? I mean, I, at the end of the day, I totally agree with you. You know, the, the safety aspect, 100%. We need, to be, we need to be designing these things to be inherently safe, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. I don't have an exact answer to that question, but it might be Sorry. useful. Go ahead. Oh. Did you want to say something? The only yeah. thing I was going to say is not an answer to that question expressly, but we had a, we have a similar set of questions in Stockton and San Joaquin County. And one of the questions that we have put forward to the Department of Energy is, tell us the likelihood of a carbon leakage event if we pipe something under a mile underground, right? What is that implications for wildlife, water, food, all the rest of it? So we have, that's one of the questions we have posed and we are trying to have a modeling set of scenarios to understand that risk. Question? 
Yeah, it was actually a comment. I mean, look, this is an inherently dangerous substance. We got plumbers and pipe fitters that can't hold on to gaseous methane or saline injection fluid, and we're gonna we're gonna make them responsible for a supercritical CO2 that's highly energetic. And uh, it seems like every time you guys model a blowout, it seems to conveniently point straight up into the sky and not sideways into the schoolyard or onto the freeway where everybody loses the ability to inhale oxygen. We're gonna kill plumbers and pipe fitters with this stuff. We have no history of being able to, to provide reliable patterns of safety. This stuff blows up. I used to make it. There's a lot of people that used to make it on small scales. We found out that they were going to squirt it under the, the largest estuary on the west coast of North America, responsible for all marine mammals from, from Washington State down to Baja, California. You guys care about that creek? Well, we only studied under brownfields and impaired landscapes. Well, maybe somebody wants to take a look at the Marine Mammal Act, the Migratory Bird Act, and the Civil Rights Act considerations of toxifying the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. There's so a lot going on here. So I want to ask a question about safety, because we do a lot in human society to move dangerous things around, right? We have huge thousands and thousands, God knows how many miles of natural gas, of gas pipelines, right, that heat our homes, that power all kinds of facilities. And is, it dang is gas dangerous? Yes. Do explosions happen? Yes. But we reap the benefit of transmitting that substance, right? And with CO2, you know, that, that is another substance that is potentially dangerous, to your point. And it's also one that we're going to derive benefit from, potentially. So you got to weigh that, right, to some degree. Yeah. Right. It's slippery stuff. And if right. it's not pure, it's highly corrosive. Right. And, you know, we have developers that haven't shown core competency. With that. So I'm not, a, I'm not the expert here, but I wonder if anyone would like to take that, that question of, of safety and CO2, because it is one that's come up a lot. Roger? <laughs> Or Simon, I don't know. Any 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 experts here? Ah, JP. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. I'm not at all an expert in this space, but I would not have put this report out if I hadn't worked with experts and had those folks have spent 30 years working on safety of geologic storage. I wouldn't have put my name on the front of this if I didn't feel this was incredibly safe and well understood. And yes, there have been blowouts. And yes, we need to be safe in creating systems that monitor those storage facilities. And that's why we costed that into this report. That's a new piece that no, no one had ever done before. We minimized the number of pipelines as much as we possibly could. We only suggested three pipelines for the entire nation. We've had pipelines for 40 years that on the whole have been safe. So we need to learn when they are and when they're not. So I would just say that this is a rabbit hole that um, can get us really tangled when the science is telling us that we have the ability to be safe, both in storage and in transportation of CO2. Any other questions? Mike, or sorry. <laughs> sorry. sorry, I believe she, sorry, yeah, you were hi. first. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Sharp, uh, Central California Asthma Collaborative. I re recently left working at US EPA and was working on this issue. I think that what we learned in a lot of uh, work, we had a symposium on carbon capture and sequestration, is, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge that in the beginning they said that this report is not about policy, and this is very much a policy issue, you know, what, where there are pipelines and where there are not and where it's safety. And I think that's what we really need to keep in mind is that we need to make sure our decision makers are informed and they understand what they are approving and what are the dangers and what are the safety precautions that need to be put in place because they have the right to demand them in their cities and their counties and wherever any of these projects are going to be built. So I think we... Definitely, we're always encouraging everybody to look at, you know, do we need to pay for additional firefighters? Do we need to pay for additional training? Do we need to pay for, like, what are the community benefits that are included that are bottom line need to be on all projects where carbon is going to be moved or transported in any way? But, thank, yeah. thank you. I'd actually love to turn it back to our panel just for a moment here on, on, on the topic of um, uh, the question mentioned firefighters, for example, or other sort of support services, you know, and other other kind of elements of development that, that may come with these kinds of projects. And I'm wondering, you know, 
to what degree, if, if, if those sorts of topics have crossed your radar yet, Steve, or, or not? Yeah, so it's something that, uh, somebody raised the point earlier, I don't think it was on the last panel, just of, um, you know, as we saw a lot of the uh, utility scale solar uh, projects emerge, uh, there's a, a group learning that happened with, hey, there's a lot that comes with this in, in terms of a, a demand for public services, for um, potential impacts down the road, and especially once uh, like battery storage started entering into the equation as well, right? That was really something that we became more aware of. Uh, the state were actually really good partners in helping put together a set of best practices and uh, things that became more or less industry standard, at least here in the Valley, talking with my partners at other agencies, um, for things that were um, expected of developers of projects early on. Um, and, and the industry just knew that that was gonna be something that was baked in. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think there was a lot of learning that happened from, from again, those projects that is something that would carry forward into this sector as well. Terrific. Um, I think maybe one or two more questions and then we'll wrap up the day. Question? Um, question slash comment, I don't know. Um, so my, my concern is that there is a tendency, um, especially in the private sector and like the oil that there seems to sometimes in occasions the maintenance is not like a priority of infrastructure and there have been a lot of issues and sometimes in order to save a couple of bucks you can overlook procedures and maintenance to infrastructure and so my concern and also like concerns of the communities is like who is going to be held accountable when something goes wrong because usually what happens is like, oh, oh, uh, this happened, and then they wash their hands, and then who's going to be held accountable and who's going to pay reparations to the people that are affected? And so this might definitely not be a question for the Livermore National Laboratory, but perhaps more to like the funding sources that are funding these projects. It's like, are you going to hold accountable for this company to do things and the procedures correctly, or are you just going to take for take whatever they say in the reports and whatever they might omit, you just overlook. So I want to see, I don't know, Steve, if you could ex share with us in the local context here, because I think, that, you know, maybe how that works, you know, w what kind of accountability is built in on a county level when it comes to project development? Yeah, I mean, for, for these projects at, at this level, I mean, that's that's absolutely a question that we would ask. Um, I, I would encourage my board to ask, right? Th those are the things that we would want to see baked into any policy or legislation at, at a higher level, right? At the state level, to as this funding rolls through, what, what does this look like long term? Uh, to Dr. Friedman's earlier point, every week's infrastructure week, guess what part of infrastructure is? O&M, right? And so... O&M, uh, sorry. Operations maintenance, right? So you've got to look at that on, on the long term, absolutely something that would be of, of critical importance, especially if it's something that can impact not just our communities, but if other infrastructure as well, right? If we're going to, um, Merced County is going to invest $50 million in an inland port rail project here in, in the next three years. We expect that there's going to be movement of some sort of um, material associated with these types of projects. What happens if there's an impact on this infrastructure that becomes of key importance to our economy here in the Valley? Um, so yeah, absolutely questions that we would ask. I don't have an answer for you on who gets held accountable. A lot of that's going to rely on on legislation and policy. All right, Wemby, one more question over there. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, there's a bunch of people, but go ahead, sir. Okay, so my name is Tunde Deru um, with PDS, where a project development company out of Bakersfield. So my question is actually to you, and. And when you were talking about community be economic benefits, I was just curious if you could also elaborate more on that when you talk about um, specific examples that you will think is kind of notable investment in a community. I don't know where there's a neck or something. Good question. Um, I would point to one particular example out of Alaska. Um, from the oil and gas industry of all places called the Alaska Permanent Fund. Um, I think the Alaska Permanent Fund um, at a high level is achieving, is desiring and has actually uh, taken a percentage of, I believe, profits, might be revenues, uh, and actually invested it into the communities um, where the community's households 
are getting a check. Um, I think there's a couple of assumptions built into that of, in terms of do households, uh, is the technology actually safe, right? Like, is the technology actually safe? Um, are there public health considerations need to be taken into consideration? Um, and what are the mechanisms of, of why folks are getting paid? But I think if done well, and I think if there were tw some tweaks that were made and some considerations that were added, I think the carbon removal industry, kind of the big tent carbon removal industry, um, could learn from what Alaska has done in that regard. And so what I'm talking about very practically is assuming environmental justice issues it, clean air, clean water, and assuming safety and monitoring issues are dealt with appropriately, those are big ifs, but I think if they are done appropriately, then the next frontier is how do you actually invest a percentage of revenues from successfully operating carbon removal companies into communities? I think that to me is, uh, is, is where we need to push not just carbon removal, but climate tech more broadly. We're in this moment of a transitioning economy and I think we have to think differently about how to work alongside communities. Last one. I know you had a burning question, Rosie. Go ahead. I have a burning comment. comment. I wanted to offer that here in Merced County, we can start with offering all this information in Spanish. So I will, I will help. We just need to say today, as was mentioned by JP, we start now. Let's do it right now. We'll start here in Merced County getting a Spanish forum for you. Um, I think that's, oh, go ahead. No, and then I, because my panel was short, I wanted to say two things. One, regarding transparency and safety. Before we talk about putting solar across this, this state, I want you to know that look in the Mojave Desert and see all the solar panels that are just destroyed laying there and never cleaned up. I personally, on our own farm, we invested in solar. The company that was supposed to monitor it went out of business. We were left holding the sack for all that money that didn't work for us. And then third, um, I wanted to give a shout out to Sustainable Conservation, who has a white paper coming out on cover crops, and it's, it's like any day right now, as well as another white paper that'll be on Chico State uh, website. So we're here to take action. I, I wholeheartedly commit to, to doing everything we can to work on this problem. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great sentiment to conclude on today. Um, this has been a really fa fantastic conversation, and I just want to thank again our partners here today. First, thanks the panel. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you to the Lawrence Livermore National Lab for your amazing work and the work that starts the conversation that's at the vanguard of any action. You guys are there creating that knowledge and understanding. Thank you. Thank you to the Livermore Lab Foundation that really spearheaded the making all of this possible. Susan and Sally, thank you so much. Thank you to my team at Climate Now um, for putting together all of the, the logistics and all the um, other aspects of, of the programming today. And thank you to our supporters here, Climate Works Foundation, Breakthrough Energy and Grantham Foundation, without whom none of this would have happened. So, and thanks to all you guys for coming and for being patient and listening and having you know no open perspective and um, and asking great questions. So thanks so much for coming. <laughs>